Hey everybody, and welcome to my video introducing the Hit Type camera. It might be kind of hard to tell, being a video devoid of context, but these cameras are a little bit smaller than what we're used to. So for a size comparison, here is the Pentax H1A, which is the same size as a Spotmatic, that will be getting a video about itself. And the Spotmatic just dominates it. It is multiple times larger. These are very, very tiny cameras. They are toy viewfinder cameras and occasional Christmas tree ornaments. They have a single shutter speed of who knows what, and some, like the actual hit camera here on the left, also have a bulb setting. The shutter, I say who knows what, it's supposed to be around 125th to 130th, but the timing on these is exceedingly unreliable. The lens focal length is 25 millimeters, which is the standard size for this image. It's a 14 millimeter by 14 millimeter frame, kind of. And so 25 millimeters is actually a normal, like a 50 millimeter lens. Typically, these have a single aperture, a fixed aperture of f11. There were some that had variable apertures, but most of them that's not the case. In terms of how many of these there are, the best number I could find quantifying the number of hit type cameras is more than 400 varieties. And We'll talk a little bit later in the video about some of the physical differences, and there's some really interesting links in the description that will show you uh, the differences in some of the varieties that you can see in the manufacturer, the way that the tops or the advanced uh, knobs are put together to try and get an idea of some additional information about your hit type camera. So some model history. The target market today would be lo-fi users more concerned with image size, film size, and tone. Even back when these were brand new, they were targeted to people who were concerned about size. And what I mean by that is that in post-World War II Japan and during World War II Japan, a full-on film camera would have been very expensive and the economy was basically destroyed by warfare as happens to economies in war. And so they made these small cameras so they could be affordable so people could still take images and then not really enlarge them. You could kind of see a contact sheet with a magnifying glass. That's about the best you can do. And they sometimes these came with an accessory that was a, a loop, the magnifying glass, and you could use the negatives to make very small prints. Certainly not anything you would hang on a wall. And these were very quick and cheap to make and to buy. And in the 1950s, they cost as much as the princely sum of 52 cents, uh, some of them even less. And these lead, maybe not these directly, but others as well, uh, lead or at least contributed to Japan's cultural enjoyment of small objects. And when I was in Japan last year, I noticed that there was a lot of fascination with small objects, and it was before I had gotten either of these cameras, and uh, started kind of understanding, you know, for instance, there's the Pentax Q and the Pentax 110, very popular film SLR system and digital, in the reverse order, uh, in Japan, and they're very tiny, and, and so, um, at any rate, that's just one of the opinions that uh, people have about these cameras. These cameras had many, many manufacturers, in fact, I can with near 100% certainty say that these cameras had different manufacturers and there were at least nine distinctly identifiable body types. Now where I say there were more than 400 varieties, there are nine distinctly identifiable body types and some of those varieties might have had red versus yellow versus green, leatherette in big air quotes leatherette. Uh, around them. It's actually paper, not leatherette. And so the, the hit itself, this hit right here, in fact, was made by the Tugodu company in their Toyohashi plant. 
And the first, the first ones, the first hit cameras appeared in 1937, although most of them were not produced until the late 40s and early 50s. Though not dis directly descended from them, the hit cameras and the miniature cameras in general took their inspiration from things like the midget and the micro cameras. And those were uh, small 16 millimeter film cameras or 17 and a half maybe millimeter film cameras that were used for small format, tiny format prints. These were produced concurrently with dozens, perhaps even hundreds of similar cameras. And they were followed by, though not directly by the same manufacturers, many 110 format cameras. In fact, uh, a lot of people have suggested in the, re in the resources I reviewed that these micro cameras, which use 16 millimeter film, uh, stemmed direct uh, stemmed the 110 millimeter format, and, and they they created the interest in microscopic almost images, very very tiny negatives at any rate. So I'll tell you what, grab your hit camera, and we'll take a look at all of the different features on it, and uh, we'll go through it. So here we are on the top of the camera, and here we have the film advance knob. And this is what you turn to advance the film. And then we've got... Okay, going to the front of the camera, we've got the camera's lens right here, and this one is a Crystar camera. And Crystar actually is an interesting company. It, it, it's, it's kind of neat. I'm going to hopefully, I'm trying to get my hands on a couple of other Crystar cameras because this, this is the better of the two that I have, significantly better. And the other Crystar cameras are apparently pretty nice, so I haven't, haven't ever gotten to verify that. At any rate, so this is a Crystar camera and it has the shutter release here for the single shutter speed. So you can hear what that sounds like. And it's got the viewfinder window on the front. And it also has a screw on the front, which is one of the identifying marks in the uh, type and make of camera. The other is the actual shape of the, view, of, of the top plate. At any rate, we'll get into more of that in a bit. The hit type camera has the shutter. And you can hear it sounds different as well. And then it also has the ability to switch it into bulb mode. so that you can shoot long duration exposures. Now back to instant. And you can see that the hit camera has some slight cosmetic differences as well. Off stage with you. So on, um, on the back we have the most highly ineffective red window ever invented. I have not yet been able to take film which has not been heavily, heavily fogged by the film's paper backing even when I put a black piece of tape with more paper backing underneath it over the window, um, the red window is just absolutely useless. On the bottom, we've got nothing and, uh, and, and nothing here. And then on the sides, we have the film release. And this one's film release is missing, but on this one, you just have to lift it up. And there we go. Now these are the same on the inside, basically. So here we are inside the Crystar and the HIT cameras. And over on this side, this is the same on both of them, we have the film placement reel. This is where the new film goes. And it goes inside of this little cradle right here. So what you would do to load film is take the roll of, of old film and we put it into this cradle. There we go. And then you would tear the paper tape and unspool the, the it, unspool it and load it just like 120 film. Now that said, all of the film for this stuff came from the 1950s and the film itself is bad. Uh, I've tried actually two rolls and both of them were completely wasted. There was nothing on them. At any rate, so once you load, so once you load the film into the carriage, then you just put the carriage back into the camera with the rounded side facing the outside of the camera body. And then this up here 
and then this has a little spring in it that helps keep the film flat and then you just tie it into the uh, slide the, the tab into the take up spools notch and you're ready to go and here's the camera obscura so it gives you a little 14 inch or 14 millimeter by 14 millimeter square framed images on the back we have a film pressure plate which is curved and so one of the ways that this gives you a slightly wider angle than it would normally is because the film plane is actually curved when it's on the image uh, uh, receiving the image and that probably also was done to help correct for the lens which I'm certain does not focus light on a flat plane I'm fairly certain the lens doesn't focus light in general over here in the hit type camera you can see there's a slightly different film pressure plate than on the Crystar and interestingly the, the Crystar I think one of the reasons it takes much better pictures is because the pressure plate is significantly better <laughs> But in terms of mechanics, the hit type works the same general way. So originally these took 17 and a half millimeter film on a 17 and a half millimeter spool. However, it can be loaded with 16 millimeter film. 17 millimeter film can still be had if you take 35 millimeter film and splice it down the middle. And actually they used to make film slicing accessories, a little device with a razor in it that you would put a piece of 35 millimeter film into and pull a length of it hopefully missing your finger when you did that and it would slice the film into 17 and a half millimeter widths and so then you could take that and re-spool it onto a paper backing to use in these miniature cameras and you could still make something like that for yourself today if you were interested enough in doing this and it, so on the film it would take a square format 14 millimeter by 14 millimeter image so what we're going to do next is load some film. I'm not actually going to open up one of my remaining two rolls of antique film for this. Uh, and also, I, I will tell you from having actually used this paper backing on 16 millimeter film, that paper backing tears. So if you have one of those it, that is sealed like this, don't open it because the film's not good and the paper backing is just going to tear when you try to pull it through the camera. What you need to do is get a new paper backing but they don't sell paper backings for this anymore so what you need to do is get some 120 paper backing and make your own so to load the camera what you do is you just open up the back open up the back just, just open up the back there we go so the film goes into the cradle so that it unspools in this manner there we go and both of the spools clip into the hole just fit into the holes and that's how it fits in with the round end pointing away from the direction that you pull the film then you just drop it into the camera take the leader Okay, and then you just apparently you just feed the leader in first and then you just drop it into the camera and there you go and you're set to start okay so there we are we've got the film loaded in the camera it does not do a very good job of some basic camera things like holding the film flat but uh, so I made I did not have any good paper backing to use in this so I made my own out of 120 and uh, I'm, I was thinking about making a video to show how to do that I'm not actually going to do that instead what I'm going to do is I have the dimensions for the paper backing and what you will need for that is an uh, a, a piece of fresh 120 paper and the dimensions are going to, going to be in the video's description so that you can measure out and cut the paper backing from some 120 paper and mark it properly so that you get your exposures in the correct place and the, the marking spacing will be there as well. One thing I will tell you is that if possible, make one of your cuts 
uh, make one of your edges of this paper backing line up with the existing edge of the 120 paper. That way you only have to make one perfectly straight cut instead of two and try to have it be on the blankest part of the paper backing possible. So when you advance the film, when you get to here, this is where the film actually starts. So uh, you should mark your, which I did not do, you should probably mark somewhere on the paper backing where you need to close it by. But this tape is what holds the film in place. And then I put some dots on to let myself know here's what's coming. And this is play for play, an exact copy of the markings on the vintage roll. And one, oh, one was that first set of lines, dot, two, dot, three, and then this just keeps going. And I don't know why they put three rows of markings on, maybe just to make it look legit, because um, there's only one hole in the center. And then end, And there we go, that's how it's supposed to work. And then to take the film out, there's a little spring on the top here. I keep, I keep touching this really, really hot light off. Oh man, that, my arm has got, okay. So you just take the film out and there you go. And again, you can use the dimensions that I'm going to leave in the description to make your own. And that is much better than using a vintage piece of paper that's going to tear inside your camera. So believe it or not, these little hit type cameras do have some special features. They are very, very easily concealed. I mean, we're talking about something which is for scale, a 35 millimeter cassette, about the same size as a roll of 35 millimeter film. They, aren't, they are not big. You can put them in your pocket very easily. You can also forget them in the washing machine very easily. They're often on the internet called spy cameras. Let me assure you, no one ever did any actual spying with these. The image resolution from these is way too poor. These plastic lenses are often out of columnation frankly, as, as though that matters with these, leading to unpredictable effects and results. And I would actually say that that's kind of a feature is having these lenses be very out of columnation. And so even the image circle from these lenses does not fully cover on either of these cameras, the 14 by 14 millimeter frame. The red window is highly ineffective at blocking light in a flat made of electrician's tape with some added 120 paper backing material helps kind of. The black leatherette covering on these is actually embossed paper. No matter what color it is, it's actually embossed paper. The hit brand cameras were actually sort of well made for what they were and are, and the, and the imitators range wildly in quality. Now, I will actually say that the shutter on the hit camera is better and it's heavier. You can tell the materials are made a little bit better. The Crystar takes better photos than the hit does. And it's, it is significantly lighter, and one thing you can see is that it's got these wavy lines on the bottom from the metal being a little bit too thin, and the hit does not. The hit is noticeably heavier and of, of better quality. So these can be fun to use, but the spools and parts are hard to find and they can be lost very easily. And so it's a good idea if you have any of these to have your spools and backing paper and other parts to keep some of them inside your cameras as, many, as much as possible and then keep the rest in a set container. These are really, really, really tiny pieces and it's very easy for them to get lost in a vacuum cleaner or something like that. You know, these have seemingly endless variations. There's a link in the description uh, to, a, 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 to somebody named Luke Cole and that presents a lot of really good information about the vari variations. And so some of those are the number of neural rings on the, uh, the film advance. For instance, this hit has four, this Crystar has two, and there were neural rings patterns from one through five. So, um, it, but the, the one link, Luke Cole link, only shows one, two, three, and five. It doesn't show four, but here you go, here's a video showing a four ring neural pattern. Then we've got 
These have two different top plates and there were many, many other varieties of top plate as well. Some that looked like these but didn't have screws in the front and then some that looked different, some that have the logo and some that don't. There are different structures for how the lens is assembled onto the camera. Here and here you can see they're different. In fact, this Crystar, you might not be able to see it, but the lens plate is embossed, is pressed onto the camera. Crooked. <laughs> yeah. Um, different colors for the, pa for the, for the paper uh, uh, leatherette. So, so my theory about this, and this comes partly from the research I did on the Chicago cluster, and it's, they're not related, but the same thought processes seem to be in action here, is that my, my theory is that each factory had a set pattern of viewfinder and film advance style. And the cameras that came from that factory all had the same film advance and viewfinder. And so it seems like it's possible if, and this is absolutely just a theory, but it seems like it would be possible to determine where one of these came from based on the construction variations. It would not make sense from a manufacturing standpoint to make both of these cameras in the same factory because they would require different tools for assembly. And factories aren't loaded down with 45 different kinds of tools just in case three weeks from now they might, might, might make, make one copy of something that somebody wants for 10 cents. That's not an efficient factory process and so it doesn't happen. So it, it seems logical that the factories would have a set style and that they would be differentiated by these telltale indications. So, like I said, and if you have any additional thoughts about that, you should check out my video on the Pickwick camera. These are very much like the Pickwick camera, only much smaller. And the bodies, like I said, come in nine discrete types called classes and have one of four or more neural types. They seem to have all been made in Japan until the production moved to Hong Kong. And this is in a similar fashion to the way that the Chicago cluster cameras were made in Chicago at possibly different factories. Basically, they were the same camera with different nameplates slapped on them. And these are similar, similar approach. So a couple things, don't touch the shutter or do. If you can fit your finger in there to touch the shutter, you have a very tiny finger. Uh, don't leave your, your camera or lenses in your car because yes, they can still be damaged by heat, not significantly, but they're old, they're vintage cameras and it could be damaging to them. And again, don't store it in plastic because you could get fungus and rusting on these. Uh, don't let it get wet or do. It'll be ruined if it gets wet, but... And just remember that your camera is a precision tool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should really customize these sometimes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just have fun with this. Just have fun with these cameras. They are, uh, they're not meant to be for serious photography but they're still a lot of fun to use. The hit to type cameras were an absolute hit. Yes, they were a novelty and silly and funny and that was their brilliance. If a camera cannot possibly take a technically good photo, then it can only be used for fun. And fun is stress-free and stress-free is fun. And these cameras are fun. Oh yes. Uh, I've yet to return something recognizable as a quality image, but I've had fun doing it. And so what if an image has blurry edges? Uh, today, people pay lots of money for ultra-fast lenses with lots of blur, or obscure Russian lenses with crazy bokeh caused by lens coma. And the results are considered fine and arty and fun, and to that end, I say what can be more fun and more arty than a tiny camera that sets out to be nothing more than a fun novelty. In this voiceover, you've probably realized how often I've used the word fun. In this case, it can't be used too much. So don't treat the hit as though it were invented to record an event or a thing or a life as it was. Expecting that will lead only to disappointment. Instead, Understand that the hit records an impression of an event, or a thing, or a life. That's exactly what our memories do, too. 
So maybe the hit is also fun because it records our lives in a manner more akin to our minds than other cameras. This is a piece of 120 that I cut down to size, 120 paper, and a, a, a piece of 120 paper can make uh, dozens, many, many dozens of these. And so the front end of it, over here, the paper has to be 17 and a half millimeters wide from top to bottom. We're looking at 17 and a half millimeters here. And what you need to do at each end is from the end here until this triangle is 15 millimeters from base to top and it's just a standard isosceles with a 45 millimeter degree, a 45 degree angle triangle right there. And so it's 15 millimeters from the, from the horizontal, the, the vertical dimension on it's 15 millimeters. If you have an existing paper that's not on a spool, absolutely just overlay it and cut around it. Um, the existing 120 paper is going to have numbering marks, but what you want to do is try to take this from the blankest area possible. And this tape indicates to me when I'm in the dark where I need to mount uh, or where I need to adhere the, the 16 millimeter tape. Okay, so what you want to do is put some masking tape over the back. Uh, if you need to cover up the marks, but preferably don't just put masking tape over the entire back because it'll be too thick. So your start arrows are at uh, from 80, these, these three arrows right here go from 82 millimeters to 88 on that end. And then you've got five dots that are two millimeters wide placed four millimeters on center. Uh, and those start at 94 millimeters and go out to 112 millimeters. Frame one is centered at 120, 138 for two, 156 for three, 173 for four, 190 for five. Uh, five is at 190. Six is at 208 millimeters. Seven is at 226 millimeters. 8 is at 243, 9 is at 260, 10 is at 278, and the stop goes from 290 millimeters to 305 millimeters with an overall paper length of 400 millimeters from point to point there. So you'll want to start by cutting a 400 millimeter length of 120. Actually, you can, probably, you can start it at 450 millimeters long and give yourself a little bit of uh, extra to play with. Um, cut it on the edge, and you'll want to use a millimeter rule to get the most accurate markings possible. And just remember, the most important dimension is the 17 and a half millimeters wide from top to bottom. That, if that is wider than 17 and a half millimeters, it will not fit on the spool. And if it is shorter than half, 17 and a half millimeters, your film will all be hopelessly fogged and unusable. To re-spool film onto here, you're going to use 16 millimeter film because it's generally unperforated if you get the right kind. If it, and if it is perforated, that's fine because the perforations won't really interfere with the image. In the dark, you want to cut a length of film which is 200 millimeters long. For that, you will want to have a spot on the wall for instance you could put a couple pieces of masking tape and then 200 millimeters down put a couple pieces of masking tape string out your film between those two pieces of masking tape and there you go you can then cut accurately you want to place tape at the end of the dots at the well i should say you want to place tape at the beginning here where the film affixes to the paper and then Respool it just like you would if you were respooling 120 onto 620, for uh, 120 film onto a 620 spool, for instance. You need to respool it from the back, so you actually have to start spooling at the end, and then 
re-spool it going forward. So when you tape the film onto the paper, you don't want to have it be uh, taped on so well that it can't be undone because there will in all probability be a film bubble as you re-spool it. Your film will end right around in here and then you'll just be re-spooling this way. Again, you have to do it all in the dark. Until you get up to here, then there'll be a bubble in the film. You'll want to redo the tape and finish off the re-spool. And once you get it, get it completely re-spooled and rubber banded or something like that, you can then go and bring it back out to the light. So just remember, it's not easy to do that because the film is very small. And uh, once you have it re-spooled, you should use your, your hit type camera and take great photos. So if this video was helpful to you, please give me a thumbs up. Let me know that uh, I'm on the right track. If you have any questions or comments, please put those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about responding fairly quickly. If you have any suggestions for future videos or thoughts, I'm more than happy to make those for you if I have the equipment and know-how. If you'd like to subscribe, you'll find out when I have new videos coming out. And one last thing, thank you guys for watching. However, and, oh dear, well, that almost went on the garbage disposal.